Most companies don't know how to train sales. If you look at the common trait of every successful, really good entrepreneur, they're very unique. You can just spot like, oh, you're different. Yeah. There's something different about you. I don't know what it is. I just know you're different. My first objective with sales is just kind of set expectations in the tone. I already know you're pissed. This sucks, whatever, right? Really great closers are just actually amazing at the pitch and the customer closes themselves. What I can say is the best thing that, that helped me really understand sales is, what up, Well Builders? Today, I got a guy I've been seeing on social media and I hit him up and I said, bro, I want you to come on the podcast. I love your content and what you're doing. This dude has done over 50 million in sales in the solar industry. I see him talking a lot about sales and entrepreneurship and everything else. And so I said, dude, come by. I got none other than Grant Middlehaner. Or Grant go. Mitt for short. There you go. Good to see you, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for coming through, man. Means a lot. And uh, you know, bro, I just see, you know, in the last year, you start popping up on my feed and yeah. I just saw you doing a lot of like just different sales training and tactics. And for me, I'm always trying to get better at sales. Sure. So I'm like, bro, this guy, he's saying some good stuff. Yeah. And then I found out you're in solar. I was like, okay, that makes sense. You know, like yeah. it's mainly all sales. Yeah, it's all sales. Absolutely. Yeah, man. I mean, the last um, last three years, you know, I've, I've started putting stuff out on social media. I never, a lot of times, maybe the same for you as they, you know, people will see on social media and they see your sales stuff and business stuff and they just assume you're a content creator. I'm like, no, like I run a business all day long, you know, five, six, seven days a week. Um, but you know, I've tried to put up as much content as possible out there, help as many people as possible and you end up getting connected with great people. So it works out. Yeah. What made you want to actually start doing content? So, so it was interesting. So it's 2020 and that was right when TikTok was kind of first becoming a thing, but it was more so people were dancing and it was a funny thing that people were doing during Corona. Right. Yeah. And I said, you know, like no one talks about business on there. And it was the first like year and a half of my business. And we were at that point doing over a million in revenue a month. Yeah. We we're doing really good. And no one really knew that I was running this successful business. I was 24 at the time. And I was like, you know what, I'm just going to hop on here and say like a quick 30 second thing about business or about sales or about just whatever, and just see if these people like what I have to say. And they started doing it on like the 10th video, it just kind of hit mm. and it started growing and growing and um, did it for about a year and a half. And when I knew, knew it was legit and I really needed to focus on it was I was about to take like, all my family on, a, on vacation to Europe. And this was like a year and a half, two years into running my company. And I started like really focused on TikTok and a business insider reporter hit me up. It's like, Hey Grant, like I saw your story. It's real inspiring. Can we do an article on you? I was like, sure. So she's like, um, perfect. Like, let's jump on a call. We do the whole interview. She's like, okay, perfect. I need you to send all your revenue. I need to, I need you to prove that you're broke when you're broke. I need you to send all this. So I'm like, cool. So next thing you know, like they released the article I'm in Europe. And then I get an email from Fox business. Next thing you know, I'm going on Fox business while <laughs> I'm in Europe yeah. the next morning. And I'm sitting here, I'm like, I'm 25 years old, 24 years old. I have, yeah, I just started a successful business, but all of that happened through social media. Wow. And you end up having these people all over the world that love yourself and support what you do. And it opens up doors. So I, in 2020 is when I started and this past year and a half, I've really taken it seriously and it's, uh, it's grown quite a bit. So it's been cool. I enjoy yeah. it. No, that's awesome, man. Yeah. Like I said, I started seeing your stuff, you know, last year and yeah, so it's cool. Um, and I'm always like keeping my head open to yeah. see like, Oh, who are some guys popping up that are saying smart things? Cause yeah. I always want to meet them. Um, you know, especially early on. Yeah. So I think it's great. But, uh, yeah, like the thing I saw you doing was sales, sales stuff. You're, yeah. And I don't know if you were just like giving sales advice or it was part of a podcast or I don't know how it was going, but, yeah. um, I do want to talk about sales because sure. Every business just kind of lives and dies by how often they sell. You yeah. know, if you don't sell, you ain't going to be in business. You're not in business, yeah. So tell me kind of like where you got your sales philosophy from. Mm -hmm. How do you train your guys? You know, how many you got? All those things. Yeah, so total we have about 35 sales reps. Um, where I got my philosophy from, I, I wish I could say, you know, everyone asks like, what's your favorite sales book? And I've never read a great, great sales book that I just abide by and I've just took my whole philosophy on. Um, what I would say is I learned sales through just experience. My first sales job, I, so I, I played junior college football. Okay. What were you? What, what position? Quarterback. And I was, oh, nice. Yeah. And I was playing in Long Beach, California. 
and first year redshirted and I started selling like direct TV and internet and all these different types of things. And so my first experience with sales was having to talk to 150 people every single day. Yeah. And when you do that, you, you get immediate feedback. You Were they cold calls? No, no, no. In person retail, like Walmart. Oh, Best okay. Buys, so you're just sitting there talking to people. Yeah. And I'm 18 years old at the time. Right. And so you quickly learn what works, what doesn't work. I was always a people's person, but you, one, you're forced yourself to be uncomfortable. You force yourself to talk to people and Southern California is so diverse. So you learn how to actually sell and communicate with every different type of person, no matter their age, their gender, their race, where they're from, what they speak, you learn how to sell. And what I could say is the best thing that, that helped me really understand sales is into the first year or so of my, my company, I started this team. We're super successful. And I had to, I basically lost the whole team. It was like first time I was really managing a team and I had to rebuild from scratch. And I'm a young entrepreneur, I'm building off cash flow, And I basically went into like complete survival mode where I said, look, I have to close every single deal that I walk into to grow this business. I have no choice. And at the time I was, you know, pretty good at sales. I, I, I wasn't elite, but I was a very good salesperson. And I'd say as I just forced myself into just complete survival mode. And I think when you experience something like that, that's when you really start to pull out a different side of you that maybe you didn't understand before. And that's when I started really understanding the psychology of why people buy something and what makes people do certain things. And I think the best way to, to look at it is people all perceive sales from certain experiences. Maybe it's watching a movie. Maybe it's when they first bought their first car. Maybe it's when they bought a house. And the problem is, and I'm sure you've seen this because you, you run a successful business, you train salespeople, you know it as good as anybody, is sometimes the best salespeople to train are people that haven't been in sales but have a great personality. Mm. Because most companies don't know how to train sales. Yeah. They're very in your face. They're very loud. There's weird sales tactics. And what I would say is, you know, since auto sales and all these things have had such a bad name that oddly the best sales reps come across like they're not sales reps. It's so quiet and relaxed and indifferent that it kind of breaks the preoccupation of the homeowner or of the person that you're trying to sell. And the hardest part that I've found is it's really, really difficult to sell or persuade someone when they know you're trying to actively get them to do something mm -hmm. because they're going to be on guard. Yeah. Not necessarily because they don't trust you, but because they don't know you, this is a new product. And to be fair, like if they're spending like a wholesaling deal, right. Or if they're buying a home or if they're spending $40,000 on solar, they should be called, they should like do their due diligence. They should make a good decision. So if they don't trust the person that they're doing business with and the company that's fulfilling the actual order or the deal or whatever the case may be, then it's going to get hard to actually understand what does this person actually think? Right. What are their actual problems? And when I mastered breaking their preoccupation, dropping their guard to where they're just super relaxed and it's just like you and me having a beer or playing golf, now they just spill the beans and they tell you every single thing that they need and you need to actually see if the, if it's actually a good decision to move forward with the product, the service or whatever that you're actually selling. Mm. So it's, it's almost getting out of your own way and being your authentic self. And that's when I think sales really starts coming easy to people. Yeah. I think one thing you said about just being kind of like even keeled and yeah. indifferent stand out. And I think it stands out in your content because even as you explained it, your tonality was pretty much the same the whole time. It was yeah. very calm. And you're like, I think this, and you're well articulated. Yeah. And I've had other sales guys on like Andy Elliott and Jeremy Miner. And I think in typical in sales and just um, content, you know, you're very much like matching tonality, changing your tone, mm -hmm. getting excited, getting people yeah. hyped up. And um, obviously Andy has a very different personality sure. than Jeremy. Right. But, you know, they're both good salespeople. And then I would say you're very different than them too. Mm -hmm just like I'm different. So I sure. guess like my thing is the way you do sales to me is very um, different than yeah. everyone else. Yeah. It's, I mean, there's no right way, right? If I try to act like Andy Elliott, it is not going to work. They're <laughs> yeah. going to be like, who the hell is this guy? Yeah. I, I only know how to be myself. And right. you know, sometimes like the most unique people are very good at business. If you look at the common trade of every successful, really good entrepreneur, anybody that's in social media, 
you just kind of said it yourself. They're very unique. Mm -hmm. You know, like if I see a video, you, you, you can just spot like, oh, you're different. Yeah. There's something different about you. I don't know what it is. I just know you're different. But if you're different, but you're unique and you're not trying to be someone else and you're selling with integrity, integrity, you're doing the right things. I think people can pick up on it. And one thing Amer Americans love, we learned this through Trump, is we love authenticity and we love people that don't apologize for who they are. Mm, Even if true. you do messed up stuff, like, <laughs> yeah, man, I'm crazy. They're like, <laughs> well, I mean, what are you going to say? Yeah. You know what I mean? And he, so he knows what he is and he, he, he loves it. Exactly. And that's, and obviously you can't act like Trump all of a sudden because it's yeah. inauthentic. But my point is, it's just that when you're yourself and you're authentic and you know your product and service, the one thing I will say is like guys about like Andy Elliott and all this, they don't think they know. They know who they are. They know how to do what they do and they do it full force. And that's how I do it. It's just a different approach. Let's pause real quick. We just launched something new that I'm really excited about, which is our text hotline. It is now easier than ever to get in touch with myself and my team. If you've ever been thinking about working with us in any way, whether it's through real estate investing, learning how to create content or scaling your business, we want to help you out. And it's super simple. All you got to do is just text 725-444-5244. If you text that number, my team is going to get in touch with you right away. And I, in fact, might be responding to some of those texts as we get the system just built out and rolling. We can answer any of your questions for getting you help, telling you about our different programs, different events we've got coming up, different resources that we have that can help you. It's going to be epic. So just text us at 725-444-5244. 5244 and somebody will respond to you and get you help right now. Yeah. One thing you mentioned was something that I just realized as mm. I started to train our salespeople more. Yeah. Because for me, like you, you know, I never had formal sales training. I've just sure. done it over years of negotiating so many different things. Yeah. And, um, you know, I developed my own way of doing it, which yeah. is different than most people. But, one thing that finally stood out to me when I was like, why is this person, you know, one of my sales reps, not able to close? Mm -hmm. And it's because they just don't truly understand the product mm -hmm. in and out. And especially when you have multiple products, whereas if you're selling just one thing and it's this car or, you know, solar, it, it becomes like, okay, I just got to master one product. It's mm -hmm. not that difficult. True. Um, Whereas for us, we got to learn to navigate different things. And I was like, a lot of moving parts. they just don't know the product. That's why they can't truly tell them this is the best thing for you. Mm. And so I revamped my sales training to just being like, okay, dude, first week, it's just all product. If you mm. don't know the product in and out, you ain't going to make it. You ain't going to sell. Yeah. And that's, that's what I learned is we'd have these guys that come in and, and we were talking about kind of scaling teams and, and figuring out what makes people successful is early we'd have people come in, they have the personality, we're like, here's the script, boom, boom, boom. They're in the field and they're kind of deer in the headlights trying to figure out everything. And so what we did to kind of help scale that is we did, just like you have educational stuff, I made my own in-house training program to where they learn the full script, every single thing about solar, and they're taking quiz after quiz after quiz that they have to pass at 90%. So the day they show up for first day of boot camp and training, they know everything about solar. And yeah, explain to me how, okay, let's just start from the top. Since yeah. This is important. Okay. First off, before they ever get that quiz or boot camp, how are you recruiting? So one, we just talked about this, you know, before the show started is so much is just organic through social media. I mean, I, I don't know about you yourself, but I mean, I get 10, 15 e emails a day with a resume and a long, you know, couple paragraph thing about like what they've done and they'd love to come work for us. That's one. And like we were talking about, I think those are the best people because they're passionate. Maybe they're bought into what we do. Um, the other is just through Indeed and um, LinkedIn and all the other channels and going through two rounds of interviews and all that good stuff. And so, so how does the interviews work with the two rounds? Yeah. So first round, um, typically we do the, whatever, like a team lead type person, or we also have a, a couple of recruiters and stuff like that. So they'll interview with a recruiter and pass us through that. Then it'll go to the regional sales manager. Usually what we'll do is we'll upload a clip that 60 to two minute clip in a, a thread in Slack and all the other managers will vote on it. 
Mm. So we have a different perspective. And if we're hesitant, it, we'll share the full video. And if it's we're right on the fence, we'll do a third round. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So you're, you're interviewing these guys, mm -hmm. you make an offer, they come on board. Now what? So obviously we get all their new hired docs signed. We get everything, but we basically kind of says like, look, this is, we're very upfront about this is outside sales. Like yeah. You're, you're in charge of your own success. Um, so we give them logins. We use, um, a service called teachable. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can upload a ton of videos. So it'd be like me shooting in here or you shooting in mm -hmm. here explaining how to do everything for selling ho wholesale. You mentioned all your products. Yeah. You go through an entire modules on every single one of your products down to the T. I mean, like three hours of content after every module, they do a quiz. They have to pass 90% or they can't go to the next one. Yeah. At the end, halfway through, they're doing a, a, a quiz this long. And at the end, they're doing this. So they can't even show up day one for boot camp. Unless Sunday night by 10 o'clock, that is fully done and completed. How long do they have to do this and how long is it? Um, <laughs> so, I mean, usually before they start boot camp, it's or boot camp training, which is day one of them working for us, is about a week and a half to two weeks, mm -hmm. give or take. Yep. So from there until they start, let's say week and a half, give or take. Um, it takes, I mean, you could do it in three hours if you just sat there all day, but yeah. it's not hard, but what we found is people love it because they're showing up day one and they feel prepared. Obviously they still got to learn a lot. Um, it's, it's, it's just like learning a playbook in football and then showing up and now everything's coming at you and it's a whole different experience, but that helped us scale so much, helped us retain better reps. And it also helped them start closing a hell of a lot earlier. Yeah. Cause like imagine for you, and I don't know how you're doing it now. You mentioned there's so much more moving parts because you have multiple products on the real estate side and educational side and all that kind of stuff. If they knew everything about that day one that they showed up and they then you train it. on it again. Yeah. Think about how much more scalable that is. Yep. So they got to get their first stuff done and pass quizzes and everything else. Yeah. From there, they go into boot camp. How long is boot camp? What do they do? So total boot camp is about, well, it's technically two weeks. Um, the first week is heavy. So they're meeting via Zoom with, we have a national sales trainer that day one, they show up. So we have scripts for everything. We used to kind of show up and like, hey, here's a script. Now we're like, we do an expectation call the week before. They get their logins to Teachable where they go through and do the course like we're talking about. But we also make them memorize the entire script front to back. So we're like day one, Ryan, when you get in training, we're going to call on you. We're going to make you hit the entire script front to back. Mm. So like the pressure is on. Yeah. And if you bomb it, it's not going to be a good fit. Yeah. Because we, the thing we learned is that now other industries, this is easier, but solar, it's, it's a 40, 30 to $60,000 sale in an hour over the phone. Yeah. If you don't know everything flawlessly, you're Good getting, e you're getting exposed. Yeah. You're getting exposed. I wish it was easier. I wish it was something that you could just wing because it would be more scalable. Um, solar is not that. And you know, I've done it for five years. We've done tens and tens and tens of millions of revenue. Uh, you have to be flawless. But if you do, it's like hitting with a huge driver of a golf club. You just lift the club, do the work. The product sells itself. Solar is fantastic. So we did more work on the front end. So we have people that have the right expectations of what to expect here. We're expanding, or excuse me, we're expecting excellence. We're expecting you to, you know, be accountable and prepare like you should. And I think it gives them more ownership of their own success and not waiting for us to just do everything. And then they, they mature and they do really well early on. Mm. No, that makes sense. So during boot camp, they're not actually going out and talking to people yet. They're just strictly practicing or do you get them on the phones, hitting old leads? What do you do? Yeah. So we've thought about that. So we do, um, heavy training. So heavy script work. There's just so much functional things that you got to do, like building and designing a system, how to price it correctly, how to do adders, how to handle, you know, adders and all these different moving parts. So the structural part of the actual product and how to put everything together, if these reps don't know how to build systems the right way, it can be a huge compliance issue. Mm. And we have background and we so check. This isn't even sales stuff at this point. This is now like part of fulfillment. Yeah. I mean, we, we do heavy, heavy sales training, but if they don't even know the back end stuff, it is impossible for them. And also kind of like what you were mentioning earlier is they're not going to be confident to sell the product if they don't even know how to design a system. Right. So 
you're doing sales training, you're doing product training, mm -hmm. and that takes about two weeks. Well, so the first week is all that day one. So Monday of week two, they're hitting the field. So they're still doing training um, in the morning, which all of our sales reps do, but with the actual national sales trainer. Um, and then we do a quick training in the afternoon, but they're hitting the phones, calling, scheduling, you know, getting into homes, all that good stuff um, week two. Uh, but they're running typically paired. with paired? A Yeah, with, with like another uh, senior sales rep. Okay. So like, let's say I'm brand new. You've been around, you've crushed it. Um, I'll be like, Hey Ryan, you want to jump on, you know, this guy's two o'clock appointment. You have an opening. Yeah, sure. I'm down split 50, 50, close the deal. They get to hear someone else do it. Stuff like that. Okay. So they were in charge of getting the appointment set. The red, the new, the new hire was. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So they were hitting old leads, new leads. What do you do for them? So a little bit of both, a little bit of both. They're not obviously going to get fresh you know, Hot warm leads. leads that are coming in that are, you know, and even now we have warm transfers. So it's like a phone pass off and which are the best ones, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, if they come out and they're incredible and they're the real deal, we're going to throw them some opportunities if they're prepared. And you know. Yeah, yeah. And if you don't know, then it's it's a no. <laughs> it's, then they're probably not that great. <laughs> yeah, it's, if, it's not. I mean, we have had people develop late, but you could see that their work ethic wasn't a question. Right. So... You know, at that point, they are now full time over the phone. You know, one thing I've seen with solar and a lot of these other industries is they're super heavy door to door. And there's mm -hmm. not a lot of guys who are doing phone sales. So talk with me about that decision. So for us, it was just kind of natural. Uh, so traditionally, we would set appointments or we'd have appointment setters and we'd go out to the actual home and close deals. And what happened was, is it was just more so about scaling mm. is, you know, if we're, let's, so we started the company in, in Houston and we then we went to Austin and then Dallas. And what happens is this is we had all these other markets across the country growing and we have no managers in those markets. And so instead of us hiring a manager out there or moving one of our guys out there, it's like, look, our reps are capable. Let's just have an experiment for two weeks. It was one of those weeks where the pandemic was rough and everyone was getting COVID and all that kind of headache. So it's like, you know what? Let's do full remote. Let's go over the phone. Let's adjust these things on the script. And let's see if someone will buy a $40,000 solar system over the phone. And I kid you not, that was not a thing in solar at all. Mm -hmm. Because especially in Texas, when I started the company in Texas, no one had solar. It was not a thing. And, uh, so, you know, but people buy insurance over the phone. People are talking to you guys about wholesaling over the phone. They buy most products and services besides the internet, talking to someone over the phone. So we said, screw it, let's try it. And it worked. And we started doing deals all across the country. And, um, also think about, you know, we were having reps drive to homes. They were having gas and then they had a car breaks down. They have this happen. You have liabilities with them driving all this kind of stuff. Now they're working fully remote. I don't care where they're at as long as they're focused, they're on meetings. You know, we can see inbound and outbound calls. We know what their progress is, um, but it just worked for us and it felt natural. So I, it's not that I'm against door to door. I have nothing but respect for those guys. I've done it before. I've been successful at it when I did do it. Um, I just think it's really, it's a much more scalable process to close deals over the phone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I think um, door to door is tough. And, you know, I don't really teach anyone to go door to door in real estate. I'm like, guys, there's way more scalable ways. To well, do you're this. a great marketer. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> we can just, I'll teach you guys how to market. So, yeah. um, you know, door to doors, look, if, you, if you're if you getting face to face with somebody, yeah. y your conversion should be higher. Of course. But I would rather talk to a hundred people versus 10. Exactly. Even if my conversions are less. And that's what happened. We went reps from, they could only have 18 to 25 appointments in a month to suddenly have in 40 to 55. Right. Like that. And if they get no showed or it's a bad appointment, it's a credit fail, they don't have to go drive another hour to go to the next appointment. They just hang up, take a break for 15 minutes, call the next one. Right. No, that makes sense. So with these, with um, like sales training and stuff, mm -hmm. one thing you mentioned was like just being authentic to yourself and everything else. And I'm like, well, some people are authentic, but uh, I ain't going to do business with them. No. Yeah. So like, I guess, how do you take somebody who's, uh, I guess, maybe not the most charismatic or likable person or whatever and help them, <laughs> I don't know, be more personable? So, I mean, I can't make miracles happen, but <laughs> <laughs> you can only do so much. But what I would say is one, I would say two things. One, start just being interested in people. 
like be interested. As I love saying, instead of being interesting, be interested. People love to talk about themselves. Um, and, you know, I, I think it was Abraham Lincoln said this quote. He said, if you don't like that person or no, this is what he said. He said, I don't like that man. I need to get to know him better. Mm. It's an interesting quote. And so a lot of times people are more unique and interesting than we give them credit for. And oddly, introverts, while they talk a lot less, they observe more. So they're also able to pick up more behavioral traits and differences and different psycho psychological signs and body language and things like that. So I think the quickest way to do it is, one, I think people are hesitant and not confident in themselves because they're so worried that everyone's judging them. Mm. And they're walking into a store, oh, they're looking at me. I don't look good today. But ain't nobody looking at you. That's my thing. Is yeah. We're not that cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even if you got a lot of followers and you're just on social media, I don't really think anybody really woke up this morning thinking about me and Ryan. No, not at all. Maybe our mom, maybe our dad, <laughs> maybe, you know, Probably not maybe, even. Maybe not even that, right? Yep. And so, a first thing is realizing people don't really care about you. You're not that cool, not in a bad way, but. They got other fish to fry. Well, people are just selfish. So it's just like they're worried yeah. about themselves. That's why people think everyone's worried about them because of selfishness. It's exactly. Like, well, no, no, nobody cares. Exactly. They don't care. And so that's one. And then two, what I learned, especially from outside sales is I've had thousands of appointments. Now I'm running the company, so I'm obviously not appointments anymore, but people are cool. Mm. They were more, I expected them to be more rude, more weird, more this. And people are a reflection of you. If you're a cool person, even if you're more quiet and you're just interested and you're a listener and you have, you know, doing good business and helping them at, that's your heart and you're confident in your product and service, you can be great at sales or at least learn it enough that you can add that to an arsenal as a skill set that you do at whatever you're you know, whatever industry or sector that you're in. The second thing is I would say learning mirroring is it can be effective more so that not necessarily mirroring to manipulate. I don't like that. I don't like the idea of that. For example, if you told me that you love the Cowboys, I'm not going to sit here and act like I love the Cowboys. <laughs> I hate the Cowboys. Yeah. You know well, I'm I mean? a Packers fan. They just crushed them. Congrats. Thank you. Congrats. I'm a Texan fan. So we, we just yeah, want to. you guys to. are doing great too. Jordan loves a beast. Yeah. But I'm not going to sit here and suddenly act like I, I like the Packers. Yeah, yeah. So instead what I'd say is know your audience. There's certain people that if I'm having a conversation with, maybe I'm cussing more, I'm more relaxed, I'm more calm. There's other people that know me that think I'm more serious than I am. No, I'm just in a work environment when I'm around them. And so it's like people like doing business with people who have similar interests and values to them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I learned this. Through, I lived in New York for two years. They're very brash. So my first two weeks being there, I'm a Southern Texas gentleman. You know, I say, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I hold the door. And like, what's wrong with you? Yeah. They're like, what, what, the, what the hell do you want? You know, who are you? Yeah. And you fire back at them. And then all of a sudden they're like, I like you. Where are you from? And I'm like, what the hell? And so you start noticing that people react differently based off of the way that you come across. And people say, well, I don't want to act different. And I go, well, do you talk about your personal life to everyone that you work with? Do you act, do you talk about the same things and act the same way you do when you're with your best friend? No. Is that you being fake? No, it just means you're in a work mode. Yeah. It's a different side of you. If you haven't heard, WealthCon is coming back to Las Vegas April 18th to the 20th, and I believe it's going to be our biggest one yet. We're going to try and fill the Caesars Palace with 2,000 top-level real estate investors and entrepreneurs. I've got amazing speakers like Neil Patel, Tim Grover, Dan Martell, Pace Morby, and many others coming, and it's going to be great. So if you want to get tickets today, we got some special deals going on. All you got to do is text me at 725 444 Five two four four. We'll get you info on what kind of tickets we got all the way from general admission to our diamond level tickets where you're able to network with the speakers, go backstage, ask them questions, and then have a dinner with all of us in a really intimate setting. It's going to be great. So if you want to get tickets, text me at 725-444-5244. Yeah. I, um, it's funny. I told my, uh, one of the guys that worked for me at our events, good guy. And somebody goes, Ryan, I heard you talking about culture and everything. And uh, I want to let you know, like this one guy, I did not like his vibe. And um, I just want to let you know that, you know, basically what you said, like you, you need to like either just watch him or get rid of it or whatever. Right. Yeah. And I, I knew who he was talking about because he described him. Yeah. And so I went and had a conversation. I said, hey, this is what the guy said, you know, everything else. 
And, you know, I know this guy and I'm like, he, he loves working here and the company yeah. and everything. And I go, you know, what, why did you act that way at the events? Yeah. And he's like, well, dude, like, I don't want to come off as inauthentic and be like all gung ho happy all the time. Yeah. And like, you know, I just wanted to be real with him, mm -hmm. you know, about like how I was feeling at that moment and everything. Mm -hmm. And I go, bro. Okay. If you only act, you know, just how you feel at the very moment and you, you only act real all the time. Right. Um, that's not being authentic. That's mm -hmm. just being stupid. Yeah. And I'm just like, think about this. Do you think I go on the podcast and I sit there and I talk the same way I talk to Mindy yeah. versus how I talk to the team versus right. how I talk to a guest versus right. how I would be on stage talking. Sure. I'm like, no, they're all different scenarios different that require different levels of energy, different levels of, you know, everything. Everything's yeah. different, right? And I go, I can adjust to the situation. I go, right. you know, think about WealthCon. It, it's four days long. You know, I got to be there for 12 hours a day, right? Mm -hmm. And I got to speak. I got to take a million pictures. A lot I got to do all this stuff, right? Do you think um, if I get a little bit tired, I'm just not going to smile in the picture? And Disregard, be rude to a couple Yeah, people. be like, hey, dude, like I've had a long day. No, no. I'm going to just suck it up, put up my energy, freaking give people a great show, yeah. make them feel loved sure. and everything. Sure. That is not being inauthentic. That's mm -hmm. called stepping up. Right. And um, I had to explain that to him. I go, bro, you're not inauthentic because you know, you're putting on a, a happy face at an event or whatever, sure. like you have to step it up. Yeah. And I've said that to people before on social media. They're like, bro, I don't want to be like, I'm like, bro, it's social media. You cannot just be, yeah, so this is what I do and no. blah, blah. Like, ain't nobody going to watch you. And I think it's the greatest <laughs> leaders are great at adapting to their environment. Mm. And I personally, I think if you have a great product service, and message it's your job as an orator to adjust the way that you're presenting it in a way that they can comprehend and understand they're going to resonate with right and so you know it's it's like I, I give the new york example right of living in new york uh you know we had one time a blow-up situation with a deal you've, you've experienced it i'm sure and it got <laughs> so bad that i was the last line of defense right somehow it got to me and these people i had no, no idea about them they're pissed off and honestly they they deserve to and the rep was just getting steamrolled by these people then they ended up oddly being from new york and new yorkers are cool they're great people they're just very more they're up front they're more brash they don't beat around the bush mm-hmm um, someone in the South may be super friendly, but talk behind your back potentially, right? Yep, yep. So they get on the phone and I was like, guys, first off, this is my name. Before we even start, everything that's happened in this project is absolutely ridiculous. And honestly, I think it's bullshit. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is ridiculous. How you've had to experience this, unbelievable. I don't even know how you're still talking to us right now. Mm -hmm. So at first I broke their guard down saying it's like, look, I understand. I understand what you're doing. It's like, I'm not here to waste y'all's time. This is what we're going to do next. We're not going to cancel the project because it's 90 days in. You've done too much work. It's almost done. It would cause so much headaches and delays. But to make up for it, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this. Yeah. And they're like, thank you. <laughs> and it was done. Yeah. And my rep was stunned. And they're like, where are you from? And I'm like, I'm from six. And then we it ended up getting back that... You know, I lived in New York and then they this and that and they respected and they were the coolest people, but they were talked to and only communicated by my Southern gentleman, Houston, uh, sales, sales reps. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Miss Rogers. Yeah, they let them, they let them just walk control all it. Them. And so they went to town on all of my people and they just needed a little pushback. Yeah. Now I didn't, you know, I admitted that we, this was wrong. This was wrong. And we fixed everything and worked out, but was I being inauthentic? No, I was adapting to who I was talking to and it ended up being resolved and they ended up being great customers and they're cool people. Yeah. Yeah. If you're like a one trick pony of you only have one way of going about things, then you're just not a good salesperson. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I just tell people that all the time. I'm like, look, my first objective with sales is to number one, just kind of set expectations in the tone, right? Mm -hmm. So and that's exactly what you did right there. Hey, before we even get into just like, Hey, how you doing? I already know you're pissed. This sucks. Whatever, right? Yeah. So it's like, you know, everything's just out in the open. I even do that on stage and everything else. Like even in my ads, I'd be like, hey, so here's the deal, guys. Uh, 
this call is for coaching. It costs three to 30,000 bucks. You're, you're coming on the call to learn about that and see if it's yeah. a good fit. And you know, if it's not all good. And it's just like, that's I, saw, it. I saw Grant Cardone say something. And he, uh, he was talking about when he sold the house to someone, one of the Waltons. Uh-huh. And he said his sales pitch was he walks in the home and he would say everything that's wrong with it right from the beginning. Yep. Which makes them focus on all the positives, which I love that. It's it's different. It's just I've learned that nothing can help you more in sales than learning to break their preoccupational state. Mm-hmm. Meaning when I was jumping on that call, they were ready to go off of me just like they did everyone else. Yeah. So what I did, I broke their preoccupation when they're like, you know what I mean? It's no different than knocking on a door or knocking on 10 doors. And, and the first person says, I'm not interested. Next person says, I'm busy. And they go down the line saying those same things. So the 10th door I go, Hey, Ryan, I know you're busy and not interested. And you're like, yeah. And then you can't say anything. And I'm like, reason why I'm here. And then you hear me out. Yeah. It's breaking their preoccupational state. Yeah. hundred percent pattern interrupt, whatever you want to call it. Sure. And, uh, it's funny because, you know, if you're, if you're going to just set expectations right out the gate, yeah, it just kind of like gets that man. When's he going to pitch me? When's he going to do it? It's like, yeah. no, yeah. Like I'm going to, don't worry. I'm going to pitch you. All right. But just. Let's talk about what we need to talk about first to sure. make sure it's a fit. Sure. And uh, people respect it. And even on top of that, you know, with just even setting the tone, right? I'm trying to always find commonality with somebody, right? So for you, I'm sure you told those people at some point, yeah, I lived in New York. Like I get it. Of course. Right? I would do the same. I'd be like, oh, Grant, you lived in you live in Houston? Cool, man. I actually spent a year in DFW nice. and I was playing baseball there. So totally get where you're coming from freaking hot out there yeah and uh you know commonalities now built exactly and then you just kind of go from there and you start to see okay grant is very even killed all these things i can work with this guy i like this ryan guy okay i'll hear you out yeah and you get the real the real version of themselves where they're not on guard exactly so yeah i think it's important for everyone when they're doing sales number one like you said to be authentic right being authentic to yourself is very different um, for everyone, number one, but also to being authentic to how you yourself are, are going to handle a certain person, mm-hmm. right? Because like you said, those New York people, if you just try to be laid back and chill and whatever, and they're just going to steamroll you, yeah. you got to like me authentically, I am going to push back and fight back and Same. say, well, hey, listen up, dude. Like, I don't have to be here. You want to yeah. hear it or not? Yeah. If you don't want to be here. Ain't nobody forcing you to be on this call. Exactly. So do you want to hear it or not? Yeah. And they're like, whoa, all right. You're like, oh, um, all right. Well, yeah. Well, what do you have to say? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm very, I would say I'm actually kind of confrontational in sales Yeah. a little bit because it's very, uh, well, I, I actually like the word you used at the very beginning of this because this is like my number one thing. Mm-hmm. You use the word indifferent. Mm-hmm. And I think the word indifferent is important because if you truly are indifferent to the sale. Mm. Hey, whether you do it or not, my life's not going to change. Exactly. So I truly believe that this product, this service, this will help you more than it's going to help me. Right. It's my obligation to sell you this, but just know I don't need the sale. And that's what changed. There was one tie, one simple tie down that I implemented in our sales process. And it was first in mind when, when I, I was talking about that experience where I had to like put myself in a corner build up the company from scratch basically again early early on is what i would do is i would just pre-frame the outcome and objective that we wanted and had a mutual agreement between myself whoever we're doing business with so i'd build rapport we'd get relaxed they're they're just calm i was indifferent and i wasn't attached to the outcome and i'd go guys like obviously i don't want to get ahead of ourselves we don't even know if this is going to make sense or not but assuming it does like we'll definitely get you guys set up today um if it doesn't doesn't matter. Like what's cool is like, we never have to worry about this again. And we'll just know after a day, is that cool with you guys? Yeah. And they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm down with that. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden now they knew, okay, today is a same day decision. And I've already done all the stuff Expectations. that we talked. Expectations. Yep. Yeah. Because a lot of times we don't get the thing that we want. We're dating someone, we're friends with someone, we work somewhere. And I know about you, I've experienced this so much with salespeople and hiring is the biggest issue that happens with anything between multiple parties, multiple businesses, multiple people is miss expectations. Yes. They weren't set. And 95% of all your problems that happen to do with people, which I think are the hardest ones, 
can be eliminated through set expectations. Yeah. Hey, this is how long the solar is going to take to get on your house. Yeah. Right. And it's you're, there probably are going to be mess ups. There's going to be delays. We don't owe that. We don't own the city of Las Vegas. Yeah. We don't own the utility company. Right. There will be delays. The only difference is it's a hundred percent going to install and it's a hundred percent going to work like we're saying. Is that yeah. fair? Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. Yeah. And I think the thing with expectations is, especially if you're like cold calling, but even if you're not cold calling, setting an expectation on, hey, this is the desired outcome that we are working towards. Yeah. And this is how long it's going to take because you start just meeting with somebody and there's no time frame on when this is going to end, where we're taking it, why we're even speaking. Mm -hmm. People just are like, uh, where are we going with all this? Like, yeah. why am I here? I got others like their mind starts wandering, but home sure. like, Hey Grant, this podcast is going to take an hour. Okay. You, you got to be out here by that. Okay. The outcome is this. I'm hoping that we can achieve X, Y, Z right. in this hour. What do you think? Yeah, I love it. And you're like, yeah, great. I'm like, all right, awesome. Yeah. So exactly. You know, I think people need to do that with sales. I think also too, with, you know, another thing you mentioned was just like, uh, being authentic and, and, you know, cool and everything else. How do you get somebody who's not good at like going for the clothes? They're so good at building rapport and talking and even BSing, mm -hmm. but then they just struggle to go for the clothes. Well, what I found is really great closers are just actually amazing at the pitch and the customer closes themselves. Mm -hmm. So I look at closing as facilitating the transaction. I don't look at it as convincing them to do something. Mm -hmm. So if, if I'm pitching them, I've set the right expectations. We've gone through everything. It makes sense for them to do the wholesale deal, to get solar, yeah. to buy the tech, whatever the case may be, you assume the sell and you have an exact same process. Mm -hmm. We ask for the business. This is what's going to happen next. Perfect. You're going to get this email. Huh? Real quick. What's your zip code? Perfect. What's your address? Okay, cool. What's this? Okay, cool. Go ahead. It's like literally we're just facilitating the transaction. The best way I can convey this is everyone, um, I know you've bought a million cars and everyone that listened and has bought a car before. What's the difference in the personality between the sales rep that sold you the car and the finance manager that's walking you through the documents? Um, The finance guy is just like, going through a process. Matter of fact. Yeah. It's already been sold. So it's just, they just basically can't F it up. So they're yeah. like this, you have a question, they, they answer it. Yeah. They say this, do this. That's kind of what closing is like. It's facilitating the process. Mm. The mistake that people make is they start getting into the close and they start overcompensating. They start explaining why it's great. They start keep reminding them why it's a good deal. Yeah. yeah. They do all those things. And you need to shut up. You're at the front doorstep with the girl. Yeah. She's playing with her hair. She keeps looking at you. She wants you to kiss her and you start talking about football. Yeah. Yeah. Just kiss the girl. Yeah. So closing is done before you get to the close. The actual close is about not saying something dumb. It's just a formality. It's just a formality. It's just actually facilitating the actual transaction. And when they have questions, when they have objections, great question. Grant, how long is this insult? What's going to happen if it gets delayed? Then Saul would just be pushed back further, but you guys won't pay anything until three months after installation. So yeah. go ahead and go to section nine. So this means, hey, Grant, when is the site survey going to be? It's going to be next week and we're between Tuesday and Friday. We'll have the team reach out. Does that make sense? Perfect. Let's go to section 10. Yeah. So what do you do um, for the objections before you get to, okay, price is good, you know, et cetera. Like, okay. So you give them the price and they're like, well, that's a lot of money. How do you handle that objection? Well, I think a lot of those type of object objections are, are done at the beginning with qualifying the customer, knowing what they want, all that good stuff. So I'd say, you know, when it comes to price, when it comes to deal structure, you need to know who you're dealing with. So what I tell my sales reps for solar is how would you approach building and uh, sizing a system when you talk about price? If it was a family member and you're going to see them at Thanksgiving and Christmas every single year you would make sure that it's the right size system, right? For example, like in solar, we have tax credits and we have different size systems. Some of our customers are older. They don't qualify for a 30% tax credit. We don't need to be selling them a $40,000, $50,000 system. We may need to include their, their kids. Maybe we need to do a starter system. So I would say when it comes to price, it's more so the preparation on the qualifying the homeowner that they're a qualified buyer and understanding who are you dealing with. Mm. For us in solar, what's the home value? What is their job? Are they working? Are they retired? What's their income? 
You know, for us, I have a rule of thumb that if it's related to financing, people typically never want to finance anything that's more than half of their income unless it's a home. Mm. Right. So if the most expensive car you've ever bought is a $20,000 car and the sales rep explains them solar and it makes sense and the numbers are great, the savings are great, but the system's $60,000, you think they're going to feel comfortable about that? Mm hmm. The only financing they've seen is three times the price. Now you need to be selling a system that's twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars. When they see it makes sense, they're like, "Oh, twenty thousand, okay." Because they remember when they got a Honda that was twenty-five thousand dollars, and they have no problem making those payments. So their brain can actually comprehend what you're saying. Right. So bulk of that is done on the front end. If they're like, "Whoa, that's too much money," we're stopping everything related to closing and we're going right to a rebuttal process to figure out where I messed up. To, to restructure the deal, or maybe they get it and they think it's a lot of money, but it's because they don't actually understand the deal or the investment. And then you just go through that, it clicks, and then you reclose. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, some sales are easier than others. So like when I think about the sale of solar, it's pretty easy. Um, you know, you get tax credits, it can be financed. You're not yeah. like really taking money out of people's pockets. You can say that you know it's improving the value of the home like the sale is actually super simple yeah um i would say sales for what we do are way harder mm. um for example let's talk about the house flipping wholesaling side it's like okay well we're not going to get to price right off the bat you know right. we're going to figure out motivation and everything else with homeowners and then sure. by the time we hear what it is they're looking for on the home um obviously we're probably going to be a lot less than that because mm -hmm. our margin is strictly based on how cheap we can buy the home for. Of course. And so now, you know, the sale is, you know, usually somebody's biggest asset they own in their life. It's a big, it's emotional sale, yeah. It's a very emotional sale. Um, we're also competing with alternative methods of, hey, well, I could list it. I could get more for it doing this. I could fix it up. Whereas with solar, it's like, no, I mean, you just keep your house the way it is or you take this. Like everyone's solar is basically going to end up costing the same. Right. Um, versus, well, an investor might pay me more. This, like, so I think the sale is a little more difficult on that front. And then, even on like the education front, right? Like, mm -hmm. to get somebody to buy into a $20,000 product, like, they got to take $20,000 from somewhere. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like they can just go get some random loan for it. Mm -hmm. You know, they're putting it on credit, they're going to pay cat, like, whatever they're going to do, they're going to do. Mm -hmm. And so, to get somebody to part with that and explain to them that, hey, this thing that you're going to get, it's not tangible, right. you know, it's information, it's events, it's c consulting, it's, you know, all these things, it's skills. They will make you more than this if you apply them, right? So like, to me, as I'm like hearing you say this, I'm like, dude, we got to deal with way more objections and it's not like we could have stopped them early on. Well, we have, I will say, I, maybe I'm making it sound easier than it is, is yeah. we deal with a lot of smoke, screen, so smoke screen objections, which are just, hey, I'm just letting you know, Ryan, I don't make same day decisions. Okay. Okay. So we deal with, and obviously there's a lot of competition in solar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lack of comprehension, meaning people don't know how it works. Right. A lot of times people think that solar's free. Uh, so I'm never gonna have to pay a bill again. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just, it's tricky. So every industry has a ton of objections. I mean, yeah. we have a, a like three page long sheet of every objection that we can think of. And I bet you we could probably double it. Yeah. So it, every industry is gonna have it. Uh, but I will say that the bulk of it can be handled and eliminated through handling stuff on the ride and qualifying the homeowner, um, qualifying the customer, making sure you're not wasting your time mm -hmm. and getting the authentic version of themselves. And that's what I was kind of talking in the beginning. Because if I, for example, let's say that you're skeptical about me and I'm a sales rep and I'm in solar. And I'm like, hey, Ryan, what got you interested in solar? You'll say something like, just looking. Yeah. Um, saw my neighbor got it. Uh, saw something online. But let's say you and me hit it off and we're talking about baseball. We're talking about your wholesale business. I was thinking about doing some real estate stuff. So I was super interested and we we're just shooting the shit for five minutes. And then I was like, hey, man, like what, what got you into this whole solar thing? And like, honestly, man, I really wasn't interested. I just keep seeing these damn panels everywhere in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I saw something online. I filled it out. And I talked to one neighbor, Grant, like two weeks ago. And he told me he had like a $5 bill. So <laughs> I just wanted to see if it worked. Yeah, That's a real answer. Yeah. I'm dealing with the real version of Ryan. Yeah. You told me like you and me are just boys and we're having a beer and we're just hanging out in your backyard. Mm -hmm. 
it's really, really, really hard to get to that. Yeah. When reps aren't in your face too much and they drop their guard and they're relaxed and they're confident. And like you said, they're indifferent and they're not attached to the outcome. I got to get this cell. You get the real version of the person you're communicating with. And it kind of gets easy because like you're saying, the product does its work and it's just about making sense on the deal because the person likes you and respects you and is willing to hear you out. Right. That's hard. Yeah. Once you get that, you're great. Yeah. And I'm with you. I tell people all the time that if you do the right things during this, uh, I, I call it just, you know, the fact finding stage. And mm-hmm. so, you know, qualifying stage, yeah. you can call it. And it's like, yeah, you could start to already handle the objections that are going to come up by asking the right questions early on, you know, essentially, Hey, is there, um, you know, are you able to, to make this decision on your own? Right. Or d- does your spouse need to be involved? Do you got a business partner, whatever. Right. And they're like, no, I can do it on my own. All right, great. That can no longer be an objection later on. You can't, blame your spouse or your business partner when you're not ready to make a decision. Um, You know, financially qualified, right? Hey, you know, it's just investing in real estate takes money. Like, do you actually have money to start investing? Right. Yeah. You know, I've got this. All right, great. Now that can't be an excuse. So, you know, the more objections you can handle during this qualifying fact finding stage, the more, the less you'll deal with later on. And the more it'll allow you to figure out what's actually the best product for them. Mm -hmm. Because now I know okay, this person's light on cash. This person values this. This person's at this point. Great. I know when it comes closing time, this is what I'm going to tell them is best for them based on their circumstance. Absolutely. It's the little things. You know, everyone uh, tries to reinvent the wheel, but it's the basics always seem to win. And those are also the things that break down the most when you have success because you're able to get away with it because you're smooth or you're good at talking or you're great at running the business. Fundamentals are everything. Mm. So what do your solar guys and reps do for like ongoing training? So we train every day. Um, So we train Monday through Friday, but we're very short and sweet about it. So 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. we're doing training. Um, That that doesn't seem short to me. That's an hour a day. That's a lot of training. It is, uh, but we take it seriously. And and every day we're getting repetition. Another thing that we'll do is we'll set up one-on-ones and different things. Now, because it's all over the phone, we got everything recorded inbound, outbound. But we've trained it in a way that let's say Ryan, you're Ryan, your rep, and you have a weird appointment or a weird set or a weird situation. What you'll do is you'll shoot it over like on your own. You'll shoot it over to a regional sales manager or a sales director or someone in the company. Say, hey, Ryan, uh, Grant, you know, I just had this weird appointment. Can you listen to this and just tell me your thoughts? How did my tone sound? Did, did you think I could have hit this differently? And um, that really exposed a lot for us. Because before that, when we didn't have calls recorded, it was kind of a theory. It was whatever the rep told us. Mm -hmm. Well, I had this, they said this, but now we're able to say, well, of course they said this because you did this and this and this. Right. And so it's little things like that is key. Yeah. I did everything right. No, you didn't. (laughs) Yeah. And you listen to it and you're like, you don't have to listen to the whole call. You listen to the first five minutes. You're like, of course they said no, man. Yeah. You're like, oh my God. And then they go close a bunch of deals. Yeah. How many guys do you see trying to rush it? As far as what specifically? Like just, I've seen a lot of reps like just try to get to the close too fast, right? Like they're just like, all right, so here's what it is. You know, like instead of really going through the actual sales process. I've seen it. It depends on, I think everything goes back to training and expectations. Like for us, we're heavy script. We, we operate off of scripts and process. So obviously they can flow off of the situation and stuff like that. Um, so we have a pretty dialed in process. I could see it. I, I think reps only do certain things. I always say this is like the sales rep is always going to do what they're most sold to do. And that includes where they used to work. Mm-hmm. That includes maybe their dad that used to work in sales. It could be their friend or it could be what they watch Ryan Pineda on uh, YouTube and they don't really believe this grant guy. Yeah. So when they're in the home, they're going to do what they really understand thinks works and what they think is actually, you know, going to actually help them get deals. And so if they're doing that, I'm trying to figure out like, what's the why behind it? Like, what Mm. was your process on that? Did you not understand it? Did you not think he was our customer? What made you do that? Right. And if you can build really good trust with your sales reps, they'll be upfront with you. Like, honestly, you know, Grant, I just, I I didn't think that guy was going to buy. So I just rushed through it. Mm. And then you go, man, I've had an exact same appointment 
let me actually show you a recording of me in this call. This sounded like an impossible deal, but what happened is I didn't realize this and this and this, and it was a similar thing with this guy. And they're like, oh my God, that makes so much sense. Yeah, I messed up. I so it's always a why. They did it for a reason. Mm -hmm. It could be lazy for sure, but I, I think if they're sales guys and they're committed, they're doing things that they think is best to close yeah. deals. No, that makes sense. So- I mean, what's next for you at this point? You know, I mean, is the goal to continue just growing, you know, a bigger team, selling more? Um, do you want to do other things? What's the plan? So, so right now, so parent companies, Maker, Mid Solar, is obviously a solar business. Um, I want to get into a lot of different other industries um, and build out other companies. But like you've, you've kind of done similar things. Mm -hmm. is, once you know how to run a business, it's kind of plug and play. It's just all about fitment and understanding it. So I want to get into a bunch of different um, businesses under the parent company, you know, sell companies, do all that kind of stuff. I'm really, really interested in private equity. Okay. Just because I've learned so much on growing and scaling businesses that, you know, I started doing consulting on the side, not by like choice. It was more so I just had so many people asking me. I kept telling them no. And they'd have a tech business doing half a million a year. I'd have three, four sessions with them, fix all their processes, systems, change this, change that. And then they're like, Grant, we just did 5 million this year. And I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I have a passion for helping entrepreneurs and, and people grow. Um, so I really want to get into that space. And then, you know, my social media brand and podcast, it's just grown pretty organically. Um, and I haven't, had really any guests on and I'm starting to, I got to get you on the podcast eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm gonna start having a ton of guests this year. So, so you just do solo right now? I did just cause it worked really well. And I didn't want to, this was the thing is like when I was first starting it, I wasn't that big, Pe yeah. but people still loved my podcast. And then, uh, my normal brand got big. And my thing was like, I don't want to have any one of my podcasts unless if I was watching this and I didn't know who I was and they go, Oh, Ryan, oh, I know Ryan. I want to listen to this. And yeah. now they're bought in. And so now some really big names are going to start coming on and stuff like that. So I definitely want to grow that. What's after that? Um, we'll see. I love politics and stuff like that. I love a lot of different things, but my thing is just have great impact, help as much people as possible. And yeah. So like with politics, how often do you talk about it? Like what, what's your goal with politics? I don't want to say like anything about like what my goal would be. I would say is this is what I hope for the United States is that our brightest and most successful people start getting into it more. Got it. And I think the reason why people don't is because they're smart enough not to. <laughs> <laughs> like this is not worth it. This is not worth it at all. Um, but, you know, I think it's important. I think the United States is at a very important point. I think very similar to when we were in a cold war with Russia. We became the world's superpower. It was really us versus Russia and we're in an arms race and all these different things. I feel similar type of situation with that is now you got China. That's the other global power. You got India that's catching up. Russia is developing. It's just extremely, extremely important that we have the right leadership in place. And I'm hoping because we've seen this populist movement happen over the last 10, 15 years to where it's like far right, far left. Mm -hmm. And what I will say is that social media, I think, is changing a lot of things because a lot of groups of people who just always voted Democrat or always voted Republican or always did what you know everyone said at Thanksgiving is now learning the right information to go, wait, hold up. Like, for example, if you look at, I'm very mod a moderate right. Um, I typically vote Republican, but I'm very in the middle. Socially, I'm kind of whatever. But um, when you look at stuff like, for example, the Democrats have had the African-American vote since the 60s. They haven't done anything for African-Americans. I have I grew up playing sports. I'm used to being the only white guy. Every single one of them I'm talking to, to all my black friends, they're like, oh, we love Trump. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, what? And you're like, this is not the, this is like 10 years ago, this wasn't the case. And what happened is people just woke up and realized that, wait, the Democrat party took advantage of the African-American vote mm -hmm. and they're losing it. They took advantage of the minority vote. They were there on election time, but when they actually went into everything, they didn't actually fulfill their promises. They didn't actually do anything for that community, that group of people. Yeah. Now that is not that Republicans were perfect yeah. at all. Yeah. That's a whole different conversation, right? But my point is, is I think people are waking up 
and they know the propaganda that's happening. But I think still, even at this point, is we have more leverage than any country in the world. And if we stop wasting our money and resources and global conflicts that don't matter to us, and we reinvest that capital back into our people. It's key. The one thing I'll say that I that I hope someone gets done at some point is some type of educational reform. And I think we're seeing the benefits of internet where you're seeing all these young, really successful entrepreneurs and business people that aren't from money, that aren't from anything, and they're being successful early. But you have people graduating high school and college that don't know anything about finance. Their mental health is out of whack. They're going to college. They're in $100,000 worth of debt. They can't, cannot get a job. I don't know about yourself. I don't really care where you went to school. I care about what you do and what your experience is. Mm-hmm. And so I think we've been taught the wrong things. And I do think, while I am fiscally conservative, I think it's a major issue if you got someone that's in an inner city Houston versus someone that's in River Oaks, Houston, that one of them has the ability to go to the best universities in the world and have the connections. And the person in inner city Houston is just as, if not more intelligent, and has to go into $200,000 worth of debt. That doesn't make much sense to me. So I think with if we change and reform education, at least in a way that kind of how you're doing it and you have all these super successful people, if you start having different forms of teaching to where you're bringing in the best minds in the world that are teaching business, teaching finance, teaching healthcare, teaching all these different things early on when these kids are in high school, they're taking classes for their mental health. They're learning about government. They're learning about personal financing. They're learning about debt. They're learning about all these different things early on. They're learning about tech. They're more involved in the workforce. I think what happens is when you equipped capable people with resources and information, you have hyper growth in industries. And I think the world economy is going to shift in three major ways. We're going to shift into a decentralized world economy. And what I mean by that is traditionally, we had very consistent power structures. You look at media, you got CNN, Fox, MSNBC, a few others, and they're controlled by what, five, six families, right? Mm -hmm. You have finance, you had the US dollar, everything was controlled by that information. You only had books, you had newspapers, you had to go to Harvard. Right Now, the poorest person in the world today that has working internet has more information at their fingertips than a president and a king from a hundred years ago. Mm. Think about that. So you could be in a village in Africa, but if you have working internet, you have decentralized finance with Bitcoin, you can do international trade and business instantaneously with no middleman. You can build and form your own media company. You have this podcast, right? You have this yeah. whole whole company, all these people that know you, all these people flew into Vegas for your, uh, for your conference. Why? Because you have a media brand. Yeah. You didn't need to go on Fox or CNN to do that. Mm-hmm. You did that because you have a decentralized platform that you can post content on that can drive traffic to your brand. Mm-hmm. And then you learned all of these things through, yes, experience, but probably the internet, probably through reading. So you can learn everything that anybody in the world can now do for free. You can do international trade and business without a middleman with with crypto, with Bitcoin. Yep. And then now you can actually promote and build your brand with this no middleman in a decentralized way. Mm-hmm. So I think if we do the right things and we have the right leader and we leverage technology and people are equipped to do the right things, we could have the biggest hyper growth successful next 70, 80 years to where we experience for the first time pure abundance in the United States. Poverty so, should not be a thing. Yeah. So do you think though, and by the way, I love, you know, grant grant for president or Senate or something, but uh, do you, I mean, with that, right? I mean, we're talking about decentralization that anyone can do this, right? So that would apply to even, you know, taking away the U.S.'s superpower, right? I mean, that's the thing people say with Bitcoin. I'm a crypto guy too. So it's just like, all right, well, we can, I can transfer you Bitcoin right now, this very moment, anywhere in the world, right? That's mm-hmm. the beauty. And no, the U.S. can't stop it. China can't stop it. No right. one can stop it. That's amazing. Um, but, you know, it's like, okay, well, each world power is going to try and use all the same tools and technology, AI, crypto, sure. social media for their own advantage. They always will, but it's going to be hard. I mean, think about this is one thing I was thinking of is um, like Bitcoin just got the first ETF, right? It's been waiting. It took a long time. And now it's like, all right, 
the powers are going to try and get as much Bitcoin as possible. Of course they are. Uh, but what I'll say is like information is power. And keep in mind this is that, you know, we're about 10 years out from having supersonic flight again. We're probably 20, 25 years from hypersonic. And what, Elon, would, what, would the, what would be the benefit of those? Speed. So like, let's say right now, what time is it right now? Like 3.30, something like that. Yeah. 4.30, whatever it is. What if we have hypersonic travel? Or let's say eventually what Elon Musk is saying, hypothetically, you could literally, you and I could get in a rocket and in 44 minutes land in Shanghai, China. Mm. Hypothetically, you and me, let's say we we're doing this podcast at 10 a.m. We could jump on a hypersonic flight and you and me could have dinner with people doing business in Dubai. Right. So why am I tied to the United States? Why right. am I tied to this location? And yes, are the normal power structures going to try to control everything with AI, with Bitcoin, with everything? Yes. But in the past, they could hide this information and this intelligence. If you didn't go to Harvard, you wouldn't know that you could utilize things like Bitcoin. You wouldn't know that you. this is how you got to do it. You got to know the executives at Fox. You got to know the executives at CNN. You got to right. know this person to get the job at JP Morgan. Now you have normal everyday people that can learn just as much about anything as the kid that went to Harvard or family was a billionaire, you're going to have a little bit of the destruction or the destruction of the, the normal power structures. And the reason why an ETF got approved and why it didn't get approved five years ago is because big money got involved with Bitcoin that has real life leverage. That's it. Yeah. It wouldn't have happened five years ago because there was not enough leverage. Now you got a trillion plus dollars in the entire market. Think about how many really wealthy, successful people that are paying a lot of these politicians would be really pissed off if they ban Bitcoin tomorrow. Yeah. They would be out of office really, really, really fast. So my point is, is if we can find a way to equip all of our people and the right immigration coming in, I mean, that's our superpower. Immigrants created the country. If we can continue to have the smartest and brightest minds in the world from all over the world come here to start their businesses, to build their families and have intelligent people and we equip them on top of all the people that we have now, the opportunity, not just here, but all over the world is astronomical. Mm. I think we're just at the beginning stages. Mm. Because, I mean, I mean, think about the abilities, man. I mean, every single human being in the United States in probably 20 years is going to be able to have technology that they would used to have to pay tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars with a lawyer or with a doctor. Like you say, hey, chat GPT, write a season to assist letter for me. And it's done. Done. Hey, this happened, this happened. Done. Yeah, that I mean, will definitely happen. I mean, ultimate leverage. We're going to have to where instead of us hiring 50 sales guys, they listen to all of the recordings of all the best closes for the last 50 days. And the AI speaks as intelligently or better than you and me without any mistakes and no emotion. It's flawless. Now we have infinite scale. Mm -hmm. And when we have enough resources for no one should be in poverty right now. It's just, I think there has to be a balance of, yes, I'm a hundred percent a capitalist. Like I said, I'm fiscally conservative, but I also believe that we have enough resources. Like Elon Musk says, a small corner of Utah of solar panels could power the entire United States. Why the hell is that not a thing? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. We have that technology. So it's just about using it. Probably because uh, solar companies would be out of business. Yeah, there you go. And then and all the utilities would be out of business. Yeah. Everybody's out of business because of this one thing. So, yeah. and, and people don't want that. Yeah, so it's it's interesting, but if if they can get term limits in the Senate and the House, so you decentralize that. So now you got people coming in. I liked what Vivek said that he wants all he wants actually an eight eight year limit on bureaucrats in the actual government. Meaning if you work for the FBI, you can't work there more than eight years. Mm. Which is pretty interesting. Because that breaks the potential, you know, corruption and anything. I've of saying that if it's tied to people, it's corrupt. Mm. everything because people are imperfect yeah there's good businesses there's bad business but you trace everything back there's someone along that chain that's yeah they're going to give that deal this way because they've known them for 20 years and yep. they play golf together like it's always going to be like that so the only way to do it is to decentralize it as much as possible and have the best resources people information technology in a concentrated area 
And if you have the right smart, intelligent people there, the country is only going to get better. So what's your plan right now with so much tech available to utilize it? Like the, for something today, obviously a lot of things we're talking about are very far out, but what are you excited about today with tech and how it's improving business? You well, specifically. Well, so the thing about tech is it just creates a leverage. And so what we were talking about this before is like, you know, even with me with a solar business, right? It's basically me mastering sales and marketing, hiring, recruiting. Yeah. You know what I mean? You and wholesale and look very similar to that, right? Now, when you're getting real infrastructure involved, it's a lot more complex. So what I'd say is what I've learned that the best people in business, politics, and life don't win. It's the people with the most leverage that do. All of life is is a game of leverage. If you and me are going head to head, you have 100 sales reps, I have 30. I don't care if I'm <laughs> two times better than you, you're going to smoke me every time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... If, you know, you've talked about how you've mastered digital marketing and you've dropped your lead costs a 10th, right? The average lead is this and you're getting it for this. That's leverage. Mm -hmm. So even if I'm better at, let's say I have that same business and I'm fantastic, but my acquisition is 10x the cost of yours. Mm -hmm. You're profitable, you scale faster, it's leverage. So what I'd say when it comes to technology is just learning it and absorb it as fast as possible. That's what helped me do good in crypto is in 2015, 2016, I was like, man, this is going to be a thing. And in 2018, when it was in the gutter and it was $3,000 and uh, for Bitcoin, I was just buying every week, buying every week, buying every week. You know, I started doing crypto mining. I was like, I'm going to do this. No one did crypto mining. Boom. All of a sudden this, boom. All of a sudden this happens. All of a sudden I make money here. All of a sudden I end up on Fox. All of a sudden all these things happen. I learned a lot to where now I'd consider myself an expert. Prior to that, I didn't know anything about it. It just started with buying a little bit of Bitcoin and then YouTubing it and then reading about it and experiencing it. And so the same thing with AI and stuff like that is just, I'm trying to learn as much as I can about it. I'm not a tech genius, you know, CEO by any means, but you don't have to master at it, right? You can get the best people, but as long as you understand it and you can hire and work with and partner with the brightest minds in the world, if you understand it enough, you can make a decision on it. Yeah. No, and that's the beauty of just to, to tie it all together that, you know, information is so freely available now. So no one has any excuse for being broke in yeah. today's world. You know, like you said, there's plenty of resources everywhere and you can create your own business from your room. I actually heard Jeff Bezos say something on um, Lex Friedman's podcast that was really good. Mm -hmm. And he was just talking about, you know, building Amazon. And he said that, you know, somebody had put in the work to develop the internet for decades prior to him. Yeah. And he was the beneficiary of that. And he was able to launch an online bookstore and, you know, it evolved over time. And now Amazon isn't just like, there's so many things that Amazon is. It's not a bookstore. It's not just e-com. It's also um, Prime. It's also mm -hmm. AWS. Yeah. It's also logistics. It's, it's, it's so many things now. Right. And uh, he was like, you know, we've always had to constantly adapt. But he basically said that, you know, right now his big thing is space. He's like all in on space. So is Elon and everyone else. And um, he's like, my dream is that in, you know, a couple of decades from now, people will start space companies in their bedrooms. He's like, people start businesses right now in their bedrooms. You start, you can start a solar business in your bedroom. You can start a wholesale business in your bedroom. Mm. So it's all because of the the groundwork that all these other guys laid that allow us to do that. Mm -hmm. We can start YouTubing right now, picking up a camera, start our own media company with an iPhone. Crazy. You know? So he's like, in a couple of decades, people will start space businesses in their bedroom. And he's like, and that will be mm -hmm. what I've been working for. I was like, wow. Sinking big. But he's right. Because that will happen. Yeah. It's just time. Yeah, I think it's just it, talking to super smart people, you know, and you, you talked, it's like, you're like, I always love learning. Like, I love, I'm like, tell me about this wholesale business. It, you just, you get around really smart people. You listen to podcasts, you read books, you learn things and you have a good business. You have a good brand. Opportunities just present itself. And Richard Branson said, opportunities are like bus stops. If you miss one, another one's coming. Yeah. It ain't the only one. Yeah. It's a, they're always coming. Yeah. And if you're positioning yourself, you're, you're going to, you're going to walk into something eventually. Yeah. No, I love it. Well, bro, I've had a lot of fun getting to know you and meeting you, man. It's been uh, great. I'm excited uh, to see where you're headed with all that. I love guys who think about tech in the future. I'm very future focused. And, yeah. you know, I love crypto. I love AI. I love 
social media and me, you know, everything. Yeah. So same mindset there. And, um, where can people start, you know, following you if this is their first time? Yeah. I mean, on social media, just at Grant Mint on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, all those things. And, uh, the Grant Mint podcast, I got to get you on. Yep. Yeah. We'll you know, I'll come. I, I'm supposed to come back to Vegas, uh, in a month or two. So yeah, we'll maybe film it. we can coordinate some. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Well, dope. Guys, go follow Grant and subscribe to this podcast and we'll catch you on the next one. Peace. Look at successful companies we love. Most of them actually started cheaper and faster than we realized. So take Airbnb. That started in a weekend. Like I worked for Zuckerberg directly. I believe it was a weekend, if not a week, he was able to build Facebook, which is now a trillion dollar business. Everyone has a weekend available to change their life. 